hey, how you all doing? It's Sandy from Syntrace Chemicals. And uh, one of the things I wanted to do with um, my uh, YouTube channel is to um, change people's opinion on uh, looking at different plants around the garden and uh, seeing their benefits and their uses. And I'm going to use this small series to discuss the plants around the garden and uh, hopefully give you a different perspective. So that first one we're going to use is one everybody would have come across, whether you were a child or an adult, and it's the stingy nettle. You would have brushed up against it when you're playing, out walking, everybody knows about the stinging nettle. And uh, they see it as an irritation or a weed, something to be sort of like pulled out and uh, kept away from. But hopefully after I've um, discussed a bit more about it today, it'll give you a different perspective on it. And uh, you'll look at the humble stinging nettle as something uh, very beneficial. So I'm going to take you up to the wooded area at the top of my garden and um, we'll discuss it a little bit more. So here we are up in the wooded area and this is a particular spot where the nettles are starting to grow. It's springtime, it's March here in the East Midlands in the UK. And of course the nettles are growing quite prolifically now. It doesn't take long for them to be this tiny and they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So what can we tell you about the stinging nettle? Well, first of all, its uh, Latin name is Urtica doerca, and it's uh, how do you identify that it, you've actually got the stinging nettle? Because there are some similar plants that you might think are stinging nettles, but are not the true stinging nettle themselves. So the first way of identifying them is their leaves. Always got these very good jagged edges to their leaves, serrated almost, and the actual word does come from uh, meaning lion's tooth because they're meant to le look like lion's teeth with that serrated edge and you everybody knows about these stinging hairs on the stinging nettle so obviously they've got to have those as well and then if you look at the stems you've got a bit more of a square stem and this is uh, indicative also of uh, the mint family so that's another way of identifying them they don't always have hairs on top of the leaves as well as underneath and the stem but uh, different species do the ones in Europe do you can see there's a little bit more you see the hairs there and then the last way to identify that it's the true stinging nettle if I can get an angle where you can see the leaves properly the leaves actually grow opposite each other and on other false stinging nettles or the wood nettle they will grow alternately so you know you've got the true stinging nettle by the fact that the actual leaves are growing opposite each other That's it. can you see that a little bit more on that example there they're exactly opposite each other so that's how you identify that you've got the proper true stinging nettle and then why does it sting so plants often need defenses and the stinging nettle doesn't have a particularly thick bark to protect it it doesn't have thorns or it doesn't have a particularly bad taste so the ways it's developed its defenses is to use these very 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 fine little hairs and these are called trichomes now trichome in greek Trichoma is where it comes from, it literally translates as hairs. And these little hairs are made of silica, they're hollow, and they contain a cocktail of chemicals that are designed to protect the plant. And it is because of these, when you're brushing against it, it has a very fine little silica cap on them. And then as soon as you brush against it, that cap falls off and then it exposes the very very sharp hypodermic needle almost hair that pierces the skin and then different people get different reactions and also it depends on how much you brush up against the needle because if you imagine it as a pipette with all the chemicals mostly at the bottom of the hair and then if you brush against it and push against it so it bends a little bit more of the hair as it pierces the skin then more and more of the chemicals are actually released. So what is exactly that causes, what are the chemical compounds that are in the hairs? So basically there's, they've been identified, they thought it was formic acid 
um, a bit like um, what you get with ants being an irritant but uh, a lot more research has been done into nettles and they've worked out that there's three neurotransmitters and three acids now those three neurotransmitters are histamine serotonin and acetylcholine and basically <laughs> serotonin we know <laughs> it's the happy hormone uh, not when it's injected and a histamine we all, all know as an inject as an irritant so when they're injected into the skin they actually cause the pain and the inflammation and the severe reaction in some people as well and then couple those three neurotransmitters as if that wasn't enough they have the three acids that are mixed in there as well and you've got oxalic acid you've got tartaric acid and you've also got some of the formic acid and those three are designed obviously to work in conjunction with the neurotransmitters and make sure that that pain is actually lasting a little bit longer than just a momentary thing because that wouldn't deter an animal um, and so it's designed to make that pain be an irritant for a lot longer and then they're less likely then to come back and uh, eat the plant. So how can you counteract those plants defences um, if you do get stung? Most people used to, perhaps as a child, you were told that dog leaves or other plants could help um, but you need a plant specifically designed that is an anti-inflammatory to counteract that or an antihistamine and um, some people might use creams like calamine lotion or an antihistamine cream that will help um, stop the inflammation and the irritation but there are plants naturally that um, you can also use and if I pan down here you'll see another plant it tends to grow often you've got the kill and the cure um, growing together that's cleavers and that tends to grow in and around the nettles and cleavers and plantain and a couple of other plants if you actually rub them together in your fingers they'll produce a juice and that juice is an anti-inflammatory and you can put that onto the actual sting and it'll help reduce the effects of it you won't eliminate it completely but it will certainly help reduce the effects of it in the long lasting um, time scale of it as well you just got to keep rubbing it in your fingers and you'll see the moisture come out of it and that can be put onto the onto the stings. You obviously know that this plant has um, produced this defence mechanism, but why? Why does it um, want to be defensive? And the reason is because it's highly nutritional. Its values and the, the different compounds that it has in it, um, it would literally be decimated by herbivores and um, it certainly wouldn't have lasted as long as it has done to now. So what what can we um, find? What benefits are found in the nettle? Well, it's very, very high in iron. I think a lot of people know about its iron contents, but there's magnesium it's very high in, it's high in calcium, and it's high in a lot of different vitamins. Uh, vitamin A, vitamin B, but specifically vitamin C is the surprising one. Um, there's more value in... in content of in the nettles in the vitamin C is four times as much as you would get out of an orange so that really does show how how high the content of just the vitamins and the minerals alone but then not only that they're high in fiber so they're very good for you in fiber and then if that isn't enough they're extremely high in protein um, they have 30% and above of protein um, percentage there so I tend to use them I pick the leaves and I dry them in my dehydrator and I make them into a protein powder which I add to um, different foods or drinks and use that to make sure I can get the beneficials that way so the beneficial times really is to pick in the actual nettles um, if you're going to use it for nutritional value is in the springtime um, you'll notice in the springtime that you've got all these lots of these little tiny leaves and that's when it's it is most potent if you like um, they're, they're very dark the leaves and they've got the most nutritional value then so that's the best time to pick them or if they're a little bit bigger like these ones here as they're starting to grow you want to just pick off the top six six leaves because that's where the most um, potency is and then obviously they can get higher and bigger and bigger and bigger as they grow um, these ones over here are starting to get about a foot now um, and they'll get more fibrous and woodier as they obviously they get um, older but you can still use the top leaves and then by the time it goes to seed um, the value in the leaves has dropped considerably 
um, but you can also use the seeds they're very high in vitamin E so you can have those added to different things so that's another benefit from them so we've seen that nettles have a very good nutritional value and a very good defense mechanism but how can they also be why do we not need to get rid of them we're not going to use them for nutritional value um, we can still be a benefit to us in our gardens um, because I'm going to take you over to the compost heap and show you the reason why. So this is my compost heap. I've been uh, using some of this on my no-dig beds. But guess what's growing on top? Nettles. And they grow prolifically. They're a very, very good indicator of excellent moist soil that's um, very, very good for the garden. So wherever you see them growing, you know that that area is very, very good soil. And you could... Um, especially if it's a compost heap you could use that on your your no dig beds or you're or adding it to um, other areas of the garden the other reason I'm going to brought you down here to the compost heap is to show how how they grow let's see if we can move this around and let you see see these roots I just wanted to show you because obviously this is a brilliant perfect analogy here I can show you where how it's uh, they spread so quickly. The roots here are extensive and then it'll spring up little plants from the new roots. Can you see? So if you're if you are wanting to eliminate them from a certain area of your garden, not only are you gonna have to cut down the tops, um, and we can uh, discuss a use for those in a minute but you'll have to make sure you get into the soil and eliminate these roots because that's those roots that they shoot out and then little plants will come off that so you won't really be able to eliminate it unless you get rid of most of those roots and then another if it is an area that you're trying to repurpose in the garden the best way to do it then is perhaps put um, a layer of cardboard um, on the surface of the soil and maybe some um, wood chippings to keep it down um, and that will slowly over time break down but it should eliminate the roots so if you are having to clear some of the tops there's still a lot of benefit in the garden that you can use these for um, there's three main things that you can um, use the discarded um, tops for you can chop them up pop them in a wheelbarrow take them around to I've got uh, fruit trees here in the orchard so you could either put them around the base of the fruit trees or you can um, put them around bushes that uh, need an extra nutritional boost because they're very high in the nitrogen and that'll break down and that'll go into the soil and help mulch that area and then of course you can the second way you can do that is to um, put them into a, a container with water and steep them and that will make a liquid feed after a couple of weeks so that's another way of getting the benefits out of the um, the plant and the third thing to do is uh, that people don't realize is if you just chop them up again um, you can add them to your compost heap because they actually accelerate the decomposition of the materials in the compost heap so that's uh, three good ways if you're having to clear them from your garden um, in a specific area that you could make sure they're not going to waste and reuse them but there are benefits to the gardens and the plants so if you can um, leave an area that does have the nettles here that are not in your way or not going to cause a problem with pathways etc um, they're very very loved by aphids I'm just trying to see there might actually be one on that leaf uh, I'm not too sure you can see it because of the, the different um, lighting here but aphids love nettles so if you have a veg pot I have a, um, a no dig bed that I've got down um, one end of the garden and I'm going to I put it closer to the hedge line because there's nettles growing near the hedge and hopefully the nettles will dr draw away the um, aphids and any other little insects that I don't want on my veg plants so that's a very good reason to keep them and the other is that butterflies love them and other pollinators and insects that are beneficial to the the garden obviously if there's aphids on there ladybirds are going to come on come into the area so they're another great way of bringing in pollinators to the garden obviously if you've got vegetables and fruits that need to be pollinated keep some nettles around because they're going to do a great service to your garden
And then the last thing you can use for um, nettles, if you're not going to use them for your own medicinal benefits or um, the benefits in the growing in the garden, then the, if you've got chickens or horses or um, you could use nettles, you can obviously harvest those, dry them and make sure that, because uh, that obviously kills the the, uh, the uh, chemicals that are in the hairs, because as soon as you harvest a, a nettle, it, they, those hairs start to collapse. And uh, there might still be some irritants and chemicals in there, but obviously there'll be a lot less. Um, so people either dry them or they, um, they boil them and that uh, kills off the properties. But obviously then if they're dried, um, I give them to the chickens. Or if you've got horses, I know that people um, add dried nettles to the horses feed and then they can get nutritional benefits from that. So that's all about the stinging nettle. Uh, a lot of people call it a weed, but I think it should be classed as a, a herb. I mean, a lot of the scientists are, are now starting to do a lot of research into nettles, uh, not just as a superfood, but for curing um, a lot of ailments. And uh, nature has definitely got a powerhouse in this thing of nettle. So hopefully that's changed your mind about it, and um, you'll look at it with a different perspective and uh, keep it in your garden for the benefits it has. So if you've liked this uh, video and um, you've enjoyed me talking about um, the stinging nettle and all the different aspects of it, please give it a thumbs up and uh, subscribe if you'd like to see more and uh, maybe share it with other people as well. And I'll uh, see you again soon. Take care.